I happen to be an environmentalist and I want to really emphasize the opportunity that we have at my church, because we have four and a half acres, to take care of the environment. We there has been a big movement to green congregations, and the faith community has really embraced this and taken this on, and it has been a huge effort to green the inside of the congregation. Sacred Grounds is one of the first programs to really focus on the outside of the congregation, to talk about greening the grounds, which are obviously a very important component of a congregation. And we're going to have workshops for them where they can come and learn about how to create wildlife habitat. We're going to teach them how to do soil samples, what native plants to put in the ground, how to prevent stormwater runoff on their property. We're going to teach them a variety of on-the-ground techniques. Push the soil around. This which will help them create better habitat for wildlife and ultimately people. I'm going to talk about attracting wildlife, particularly birds and butterflies, to your congregation grounds. So National Wildlife Federation for many, many decades now has had a program called Gardening for Wildlife. Our goal is to help people and to help wildlife. This program helps people Garden for Wildlife, where they live, work, play, learn, and now worship. Again, because of Rabbi Fred Dobb, we are encouraged to create a program specifically for congregations, and you're seeing the unveiling of this program. We've reached lots of people. People have perhaps seen some of the signs. We've done lots of work. We have many, many people who have certified their backyards, their schools, their businesses, and a variety of other places as wildlife habitat. We do this because the parks alone that many people think of as important for wildlife, and they are, Yosemite, Yellowstone, Sligo Creek, you know, the local to the national, are all very significant in helping wildlife, but it is not enough. We have done so much damage to so much habitat, and there's much more on the way because of climate change, that we need to see our suburban and urban areas as an opportunity to restore wildlife habitat. We know that we can make a difference right in our backyards and right on our congregation grounds. One example is a monarch butterfly that has declined by 90%. We all know the monarch butterfly. It's, a, it's an iconic species. And we can restore it by simply planting milkweed. It takes about at least 10 plants scattered in your yard or on your gra congregation grounds, and you can make a difference for monarch. That is something that we can all do and we can help bring this back. There's much more that needs to be done. It's not gonna be quite that simple, but that is one of the pieces of it. We have three main goals with this program. Wildlife habitat, water conservation, and preparing and coping with climate change. If you choose to do all these things and you want recognition for it, you can go through a certification program that we have. You can buy a sign and you can get a certification to hang. If you choose to, you can of course do all these things and just do them for the good of wildlife as well. We chose to do sacred grounds because there's a lot of land actually. And if we can restore this from lawns to native meadows and rain gardens, we can do something significant for wildlife. We also can reach a lot of people at once. By doing something here, we hope you can reach, it's a demonstration site for all the members. We have 500 families that are part of this congregation. We're hoping that many of them will take this idea and do it back home. And lastly, as we know, congregations are community leaders. That the people who uh, are the, that run the congregations, that speak for the congregations, are often very connected within their communities, in their neighborhoods, within other communities, and they're, they're ambassadors in a very positive way. And if, as people of faith, you can really, with a very clear message, share this information. So you have to do four things, food, water, cover, and places to raise young. Water is one simple thing you can do, of course, is put up a bird bath. Place to raise young at a dot shalom, we had a girl make a bat house box. You could put up, we also have bluebird boxes and screech owl boxes that we're going to be putting up here. She did that as part of her SSL uh, credit. Cover is easy. You know, you just want to give animals a place to hide, essentially, from other animals, <laughs> sometimes people. And, you know, things like rock piles are good for lizards. Leaf litter, leaving some leaves on the ground is very important for salamanders. 
Uh, brush piles are important for wrens. A lot of people have wrens in their yard, or if you, if you have a wood pile or a brush pile, you'll have those wrens right there. The last one is the most important, and that's food. Not all plants are created equal. Native plants are better, and I'm going to help show you why. Plants, of course, are the foundation for the food web, the web of life. If you have plants, then you'll have insects. The insects have co-evolved with the plants so that 90% of them, 90% of our insects, which are the ba one of the basic next pieces of the food web, only can live off of the plants that they've grown up with over time. Only those plants. So people like to think about taking care of birds by feeding them seeds and such, which is great, can be a great thing to do, but it's more for our entertainment, frankly. It's not so much that the birds need it. What they need are caterpillars. They need lots and lots and lots of caterpillars. 96% of birds rely on them to feed their young during the ne nesting season, which is just starting now. For example, a chickadee almost exclusively feeds on caterpillars. So how many caterpillars does it take? So this is what Dr. Doug Tallamy and others have found. He's a professor, an entomology professor over in University of Delaware. A pair of chickadees which feed their young can deliver food about every three minutes. This is how many caterpillars they can deliver in 27 minutes. This is how many they need per day. They spend 16 days before they're ready to fly. This is how many it takes within that short period of time. 6,000 to 9,000. That's a huge number of caterpillars. That's building a better bird feeder. So one of the things Dr. Tallamy has found is he's ranked and found out which plants are more important in the sense that they ha are host to that many more caterpillars. If you look at the oak and compare it with the beech, these are all native trees. If you really want to create a bird feeder, you want to think about an oak tree. But if you go on and look at that and you compare that to Bradford pear, right? That's an example of a tree that many are planted commonly in cityscapes. Look at the difference. You know, it's hardly one caterpillar compared to 233 caterpillars, right? Shocking. Same thing with uh, flowering herbaceous plants. Goldenrod, asters, very important. Other black-eyed Susans, a beautiful one, also important. The data do show that native plants are much better. I can show you oodles more information, but this is just an example. We've created, working with the Forest Service and the University of Delaware, uh, an, an app that will be uh, unveiled in January that will allow anybody to put their zip code in, and it will print out or pop up all the best native plants that you can put. We have this, some of this data already for the Mid-Atlantic. He's doing this for the whole entire country to really help create this native plant movement. And hopefully people will walk in with that app with their smartphone into you know, a, na a nursery and say, this is what I want. This does not provide wildlife habitat. <laughs> And we can do more. We can actually create functioning, productive habitats in our urban, suburban communities. We started with a sacred grounds project working with three congregations. We worked with Adat Shalom. You're going to see an example and hear from a couple of people at Adat Shalom. We also worked with a Lutheran church, Good Shepherd Lutheran Church, and uh, a Baptist church in Anacostia, working with Interfaith Power and Light and, the Na and a grant from the National Park Service. We tried this out. At the Lutheran Church, they had a great program. Uh, man on the top, <laughs> he uh, with his, is holding his, sitting there with his young child, and he taught a creation care class in his preschool. And then he brought the kids outside and showed them he made mud puddles on their property for butterflies to get water during, the, during their migratory period. But when he brought the kids out, the parents came. Of course, right? You can't leave those little toddlers alone. So he got all these parents along to learn about it, and he put up some nest boxes. And then he uh, gave them all a little pot and gave them some native seeds and to bring home and start their own gardens at home. It was, he was brilliant. He did a really amazing job at this church. And then we worked with a church over in Anacostia, and this was the winter 
so you can't, it doesn't look exciting yet. And then here's what they began with. They decided to create their, garden, their sacred ground space right in their entrance. They wanted everyone from their congregation to see it. The bottom is Reverend Banks and his wife. Reverend Banks is an amazing pastor. He has, really has a strong love for the environment and he's already become, he's been an ambassador for things like wind power and other things, but he's become an ambassador and willing to be a much bigger ambassador for this program within the Baptist community. And he is a strong advocate for this and his congregation turned out in big numbers to help create this garden. One of the things that we learned at Adat Shalom is that there's an opportunity to connect, very importantly, with, a, with county, in this case, Montgomery County's Rainscapes program. We had decided that we would uh, pick a site to put our garden in a big stormwater basin, which has always been an eyesore for the congregation. Again, people were thinking about the inside of the grounds, but not the outside. Here's a big stormwater basin, and if you look at the next picture, you can see why it's a stormwater basin that Rabbi Fred took this picture one day. This is for the 100-year floods, which are now, of course, much more frequent than they are really not 100 years anymore. And it does fill up with that. But before, we had it with just simply, you know, lawn type of materials. And we found out, if we can connect with the county, that we could actually transform that area, not just into wildlife habitat, but into a rain garden with the intention of absorbing more water and more pollutants. And in doing so, we would help our watershed but we also could get a financial rebate to do this work. And we'll hear a lot more about that. But we have now decided at Sacred Grounds that we are going to look for similar programs all over the country to match up, because I'll show you some of the costs. So at Adat Shalom, you can see there again, Rabbi Fred and my son came along and we got all the kids to come along and we put in 2,500 native plants in 2,500 square feet. Actually, we and we did some more others planting around here. We got a huge turnout. You'll hear more about that. We got 60 people to come and help us do the planting. The Rainscapes program allowed us to do that. Montgomery County Rainscapes program provided us $6,000 refund to pay for our plants, our mulch, our compost, and we allowed us to hire a landscaper to take out all of that lawn. That's a huge figure. This is an example of some of the flowers that came up. So lastly, I'm just going to show you we, the certification program. Besides doing the food cover water, our places to raise young, we have a couple of faith aspects to it. But we're still playing with this, but there's three main elements. There's a connecting faith and the environmental stewardship through the congregational leadership. Having a sermon, doing it through your uh, religious education. We did a lot of work with our Torah school here, and then using, using the site as an actual sacred space. Secondly, Part of the application certification if you choose to go through that recognition of it is to actually educate engage and inspire the congregation at the site through all kinds of things like newsletters information tables you can do stuff on your website and then taking action to actually do a planting day to do a workshop on teaching people on how to do it at home and do a blessing of the space and the very last one is beyond the congregation we would encourage people to actually take this out to either within your faith or at an interfaith or within your neighborhood, to do like a garden tour for the neighbors. Write a newsletter article, the man with the Lutheran church, he wrote an article that went out through a variety of Lutheran networks, you know, way beyond just his own church and his own neighborhood and his own area, region. And there's all kinds of ways that we can help spread the word. I believe this is St. Francis. A really nice point is, one is nearer to God's heart in a garden than anywhere else on earth. And that's what we're trying to create is, again, bring people outside to have a connection with nature right on congregation grounds, to feel the spirit of nature right here on your grounds. And I think we can create that easily by encouraging people to take these steps.